So thank you, Ting, for your talk about one habit getting rid of another habit. Are there any questions? I had a question. Sure. Is um, this don't know mind, um, is, is it related to emptiness? And if so, what is emptiness? You have the best questions. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, related in maybe, yeah, in some cosmic sort of way. So emptiness, it's empty. So emptiness means that um, things have no substance. That, for example, you, Caleb, there's not like a little kind of ball of substance called Caleb, which, you know, somehow exists, whether spiritually or physically, and then, you know, sort of bounces around lifetime after lifetime, you know. Um, so emptiness, this, this watch, is fundamentally empty. You know, if you, um, if you, you know, science is only a metaphor for Buddhism, but it's a useful metaphor. If you um, were to, you know, zoom in, like put it under some very powerful, better than microscope, and you could see all the atoms, you could see the subatomic particles, you see that it's essentially empty. And those particles are essentially empty. And everything is essentially emptiness, but this emptiness is not like nothingness. This emptiness is very, um, uh, very creative, very fertile. You know, uh, quantum mechanics is a very good metaphor for this because in quantum mechanics, you have these, um, you know, sub sub subatomic particles, and in so-called empty space, they're constantly coming in and out of existence, constantly appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing. But emptiness is not the same as um, impermanence. It's more fundamental even than impermanence. And you can't really talk about it in language because it's deeper than language. Language is not, is not um, fit to uh, describe it because language always works in categories and language assumes they're things. And emptiness says, no, there are no things. So how can you talk about emptiness? You talk about emptiness, you make it into a thing because it's a noun, right? And I don't know, people in my generation learn that a noun is a person, place, or thing. No, a noun is a word naming a person, place, or thing. But this idea of thingness, that's what emptiness is designed to dissolve, okay? So emptiness is not a thing. Emptiness is fundamentally empty. And it's designed to talk about emptiness. It's designed exactly like Ting said, to, that we don't know anything. You know, we really don't know anything. So that's how don't know also relates. So don't know is saying we don't know anything. The way we think things are, they're not actually that way. Now we have to think that things, like I have to think you're wearing a red shirt and I'm wearing a gray robe because that's how we navigate through this world. But fundamentally, emptiness, okay? And fundamentally, we don't know anything. And this don't know is not ignorance. This don't know is this vast and wide, whoa, what is this? What is this? You know, I find I look at the computer, I should look at the people in the room. What is this? <laughs> you know? What is this? That's this don't know mind, this whoa, this open mind. And I've talked about this before, but it's a really good metaphor for example, I once helped a friend give birth and uh, the baby was slow to come out. So first the head came out and then for some reason the rest of the body sort of took its time. And so the head is out there. And my friend didn't, had decided not to find out gender in advance. And so it was really interesting looking at this person and all you can see is the head and you know, we're so tied into gender. We're learning to free ourselves from it. But back then, we were really tied into gender. And oh, it's a boy or a girl, you know, right? But anyway, the head's coming out, and the rest of it is. And, and you know, babies are not blind. This kid, it turned out to be a she, this kid was like, 
was just looking. You could just see. You know, not even the concept of I've never seen this before because newborns, they don't have the concept of I. They don't have the concept of this and that. You know, it's just like, you know, that's still no mind. You know? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And we don't have that. We still have that. We're trained out of it. But we still have that. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much for your question. That was a wonderful question. Are there any other questions? They don't have to be wonderful. Any questions? <laughs> I'm going to have to say something if you don't have a question. <laughs> okay, yeah. so... Um, Take the mic. Take the mic. Sometimes it's thrown around... Wait, start again. Sometimes it is thrown around leaking energy. Certain oh, things yeah. that you do can leak energy. And, okay, so when we're actually sitting on the cushion like we were for the sitting meditation part, and we're coming back to our practice, but there's like, oh, there's so much thinking. It's like you know, okay, let's come back to this moment. Let's come back to this moment. Okay, it's the same boring floor. <laughs> or, I mean, I mean, so if the thinking just keeps going, is that leaking energy? Not necessarily. So, um, Wendy is actually doing a one-week solo retreat right now. And um, she gets to talk right now. But then when we leave this room, she's going to try to keep silent and go back to her retreat. Um, although she does have to have lunch, but that's part of a retreat, yeah. So this is really wonderful because Wenda is sitting there like hour after hour. She started yesterday morning, yeah. She started early yesterday morning, so she's sitting there hour, hour after hour just by herself with nothing to distract her because she's not, you're not checking your phone or your email or anything. Um, so she's just sitting there, nothing to distract her. And the mind keeps going, doesn't it? Yeah. So if you let the mind go and you just float with it, then your energy leaks. But if you see it, you see it. Oh, this is what's going on. Oh, this is what's going on. Oh, this is what's going on. And you keep your center really strong. You know, we have this mudra and we keep this mudra here, and there's a reason for that. That's because that's our, our, our center, our, um, they call it uh, Tian Tian in Chinese energy garden, and in Korean it's Tanjin, and for some reason in Japanese it's Hara, which if you've done Japanese martial arts, you're probably very familiar with it. So yeah, we keep, we keep this mudra, we keep our energy there, and of course our energy leaves, and then we make it go back there. You know, do we just push it down, it rises up, we push it down, it rises up, we push it down, like that. So we can have our energy strong even when our mind is bouncing around, you know? And then gradually, 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 gradually the mind settles. And around day three or four probably your mind will really settle. You know, we have two day retreats, it's not long enough as other people have noticed, um, but that's what people can manage. So yeah, so your mind settles and then you think, ah, oh, this is blessed, this is meditation, but no, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just a pleasant interlude. You know, your mind settles and then it pops up again, but now your mind is settled, so now you can really look, you know? And so, don't make a fetish of a settled mind, but in some deep way, your mind can eventually always be settled, even when other stuff is going on. But the state of, ah, oh, bliss, that's, that's pleasant. It's going to the beach, you know? But to have that strong center, you know, to have your energy, you know, focused, you know, focused, no matter what you're doing, that's really the point. And not for you. It's not so you'll have a nice life. It's for this whole world. And you understand that, but I always have to say that because... You know, everyone hears a different message, right? You read about meditation and mindfulness. It's always about feeling good. It's always about feeling better. It's always about, you know, but it's not about you. It's never about you. So, yeah, thank you for your question.
I you wonder, were talking to the wrong side. I wonder if you could, um, what you've been saying brings up uh, dukkha oh, um, yeah. to me. Duke, duke, yeah. duke, duke, duke. So uh, dukkha, uh, you know, it means uh, not so goodness <laughs> <laughs> when you translate it. And, uh, you know, the formulation, and the very earliest formulations of Buddhism, is, um, Jata Piduka, Maranam Piduka, Charak Piduka. So birth is suffering, life is suffering, old age is suffering. Um, this seems extremely pessimistic, <laughs> <laughs> a real downer. So can you talk about that? <laughs> so for those who don't know, this is my co-teacher and husband, Zen Master Hei Kwan, otherwise known as Stan Lombardo, who just asked that question. Um, that's what we call a bodhisattva question, which is when somebody asks a question that they perfectly well know the answer to, to um, or unanswered to, I should say, because yeah. I'm sure you would say... I don't know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> We're all working on it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, dukkha, if Stan were talking, he'd explain that dukkha is the same as dis, which is like, you know, dysfunction or something. But... Um, Anyway, so it's usually translated as um, suffering. Um, slightly more accurate, we say dissatisfaction, which has the dis in it, right? Dissatisfaction. So um, the four noble truths, the first one is life is suffering. That's what Stan was talking about, you know. I can never remember how, how does it go? It's so wonderful in the Pali. How does it go? Um, what's the first one? Jata Piduka. Jata Piduka, and the second one is Jara Piduka? That's old age, yeah. And then we have Marana. So and what? Jata Piduka, Jara Piduka, Marana. Mariam. Like Duka. mortal, Marana. Mariam Duka, okay, yeah. Um, Sorry if you didn't hear all that. <laughs> Jata Piduka, Jara Piduka, Mariam. Maranam. 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 Piduka or yeah. just Duka? Yeah. Yeah, P is like Api is also. Oh, also. Maranam Piduka. Yeah. Piduka, Jat, Jat, Jata Piduka, Jara Piduka, Maranam Piduka. I'll try to remember that. I love, yeah. I love the sound of that. But yeah, so that's our situation. You know, that's our situation. So the first noble truth is life is suffering. And in fact, um, the three marks of existence, the first one is suffering. And existence means everything, like the stick exists. So suffering, you know, suffering is this dukkha, this dissatisfactoriness, this always wanting things to be other than they are. Um, that's the first noble truth. And then the second noble truth is um, here are the causes of dukkha. And uh, there are various versions, but the one that we usually use is, um, is what? Um, desire anger and ignorance and ignorance not in the sense of don't know because that's not ignorance that's actually knowledge but um, that's wisdom but ignorance in the sense of and not in the sense of I don't know the answer to this math problem but ignorance in the sense of um, of not knowing your true nature so we don't know our true nature which means we don't know the true nature of others, of anything. And because we don't know our true nature, we have these desires and um, wants and aversions and attractions which are counter to reality. So when something's counter to reality, guess what? You suffer, right? So, that's the second noble truth, is the cause of suffering, of this dukkha. And I want to be very clear, it's not the kind of thing where you go up to somebody who has some terrible kind of cancer that causes horrible physical pain that can't be um, alleviated, and you say to them, oh, that's just dukkha. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, that's, we're not discounting real pain, but it's more this kind of dissatisfaction. Okay, so these are causes of this dissatisfaction. 
And then the third noble truth is very interesting. And that's what Stan's pointing to. There's a way out. It doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to be this way. Now the problem comes when you go around and telling other people, you don't have to be this way. No, no, work on yourself, folks. <laughs> You, you can't tell other people, oh, you know, you didn't get that job, so you're feeling bad. You don't have to feel bad. <laughs> that doesn't work. You know, so, um, so it doesn't have to be that way. And then the fourth is, here's the way out. And the standard way out in Mahayana Buddhism is the Eightfold Path. You know, correct speech, correct um, view, correct this and that. I can never remember all eight. <laughs> A light, yeah, I, I, can remember, I can remember three or four of them, but I can never remember all eight. But the point is, in Zen, that's not the answer. In Zen, the way out is just like Ting said, practice. Practice is the way out. Practice is what lets us see this dukkha rising, and it lets us see its empty nature, and it lets us not be ru ruled by it. You know, Zen Master Sung San always used to talk to backseat driver. He would say, you tell your backseat driver, shut up! Yeah. <laughs> Except he would really shout. Okay, I didn't want to break the microphones. Um, so, yeah, so this backseat driver, this dukkha that runs around with us all the time, that makes our mind swirl and swirl and swirl and swirl and swirl. Yeah, just... In fact, you don't even have to tell it to shut up. Just don't listen to it. You can let it jabber, 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 but you don't have to listen to it. It's just there, background noise. You know, just bring your mind back to your practice or your driving or your cooking or your conversation with your friend or your diapering your baby, you know, whatever it is. Just bring your mind back to computer game, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> um, yeah. Just bring your mind back to what you're doing, and you don't have to let it run you around like that. So was that an acceptable response? Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got my cusses all on me. Are there any other questions? We have a couple of minutes for other questions. I have a question. Um, okay. See, I'm trying how to do you? Oh, there we go. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's, yes, Mario, hi. Okay, yeah. hi. Um, how does this idea of coming back to practice and this, I guess, managing the suffering apply in the context of like external violence? So if you're, I'll use like a traditionally oppressed or marginalized groups of people experiencing violence and oppression how do you maintain this practice when you have these very real external factors uh, that are maybe not in your control how do you kind of navigate that that's a really important question and it's just a, not just people who are marginalized you know it's every one of us finds ourselves in situations where we have no control there's somebody else who's in charge and causing great suffering. And that Stan and I were talking the other night about that, of something way in our past where someone had, it wasn't like physical violence, it was very subtle, but it caused me tremendous pain. And I said to him, how could I have responded better than I did? So yeah, so the first thing is to not say that there's no suffering. There is suffering and it's real. And you have to acknowledge that. And then the question is, how do you respond? And that response has to come from this deep center, this strong center, and this don't know. So, you know, this wisdom, this wisdom, it has to come from there. And it can't be limited by your own, your own situation. It somehow has to be wider than that, bigger than that. You know, and out of that, hopefully something will come. And sometimes, you know, you look at the civil rights movement, I've been thinking about this a lot because of the way things are going now. And you look at the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement started in like the late 18th century. Think about it. It started with a few people who said, you know, slavery, man, you know, that's not such a good thing. 
you know. And then, you know, we had a civil war and, you know, officially there were no slaves, but you look at how certain economic structures were and you look at the prison system, which in certain places was designed exactly to reproduce slavery, you know, the, the plantations down in the southern prisons exactly reproducing the situations of slavery, except it was just one gender, and they didn't have families. And so you, you had that, and then you had a, a kind of an opening, but then you had this, um, you know, the end of this opening, you had segregation coming in. I mean, we're talking about something that took 200, no, 150 years at least to get rid of the most obvious forms of it, and it's still with us in some way or another, okay? So you look at that, you look at civil rights, you know, for, for African Americans, and now we're including, you know, other people who don't have skin my color, you know, in that. And you look at the patience that it takes. It takes tremendous patience, and it takes tremendous solidarity you know, it's not about me, it's about us. It takes this tremendous solidarity. You know, you, you, you read or hear the speeches of the great civil rights leaders in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, and they have this wide view. It's really remarkable. And then in a smaller time frame, you think of women's suffrage. Women's suffrage took about like 70 years, 80 years, something like that, to come about once people started talking about it. You know, so you look at women's suffrage, and again, you have to have patience, and you have to have this bright, wide view, and you have to acknowledge the suffering. You acknowledge the suffering, because you can't, you can't, um, you can't remove its conditions without acknowledging it. And there's so many things that you can point to, you know, gun violence, which we have not figured out. We have not figured out how to deal with it. And I have old friends from graduate school who are very, very involved, you know, in, in, in dealing with this. And, you know, it's always, it's always patience. It's always wisdom. It's always solidarity. That's, and it's always acknowledging the suffering and not trying to, you know, talk it away, but acknowledging the suffering, acknowledging the causes of suffering. So, yeah, it's... Good luck to all of us who are working on this. It's non-trivial, you know, and some of us are bit players and some of us are major players, but we all have to work together. Yeah, so thank you. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. I want to say something else about that. Um, a lot of the leaders, especially in civil rights, they came out of very strong religious faith. And that faith is what gave them that strong center. And it gave them the ability to put down their personal fear. And this practice can do the same. This practice can give us this strong center. Because you need a strong center, you really do. So thank you very much. And that's the end of time of questions. So let's turn the recording off.